What parts should you buy for a Star Citizen PC build in 2023 and onwards into 2024? In this video, we're going to be focusing on high-end performance, getting as much performance as we can out of Star Citizen. If you're after a more budget look at this, check out my minimum spec video from earlier this year. We're going to cover all the main parts that you'll need and even some extras that really elevate the Star Citizen experience. If you want to chat some of this through, come and join the Discord. Lots of people there to help you out with a PC build. Let's start off with the CPU because as you may be aware, Star Citizen is very, very heavily CPU bound in most parts of the game. To get a little technical for a moment, Star Citizen's engine is heavily reliant on its main thread, which does a lot of game logic and other stuff. And also it's render thread, which is concerned about rendering each frame. Even though CRG have done a lot of work to spread the CPU work across multiple cores that your PC has, those two threads are still often the bottleneck. So what does this actually mean for a CPU recommendation? Well, you want a CPU with the ability to get through its work as quickly as possible. You want fast single threaded performance. You might be tempted by some sort of monster CPU with a hundred cores and threads, but extra cores won't help. You want really fast cores. You're gonna want either AMD or Intel's latest and greatest. I've tested the 7950X3D, the 7800X3D, and the 7700X from the latest AM5 platform. And I've also on the Intel side tested the i7-12700KF and the i7-13700KF. We won't mention the 14th gen because that's a bit of a scam. They're basically the same as the 13th gen. But if you're shopping now, you should probably get 14th gen if you're gonna go Intel. Out of the box, based on the prices of all of these CPUs, the 7800X3D is hard to beat. It performs pretty much as well as the 7950X3D and it costs a lot less. You also, with AMD and the AM5 platform, have the ability to upgrade to future CPUs that they release, something that you don't get with Intel. On the Intel side, if you're prepared to spend quite a lot more money on something like the i9-14900K and then overclock the heck out of it, you can see great performance. But again, you won't have an upgrade pass, so I'm pretty hesitant to recommend that. Also, Star Citizen does not play well with Intel's E-cores, the efficiency cores, so you'll either have to turn them off in the BIOS or use something like Project Lasso to sort them out in Windows. And for those of you with AM4 motherboards, the 5800X3D is still a great upgrade option, but I probably wouldn't choose that if I was building a brand new machine. For me, AMD's AM5 platform is the best long-term bet if you're building a PC right now. But be warned, even with these top-end CPUs, Star Citizen performance will still not be perfect. You'll still get stutters and hitches in certain parts of the game, and your overall numbers still won't be great compared to a lot of other games. Let's move on to GPUs. Because Star Citizen is mainly limited by the CPU, targeting high refresh rates is pretty much impossible in some parts of the game. Out in space or on an empty moon, you can see over 100 FPS, but in the cities, if you've got one of these really high-end CPUs, you're still really only targeting 60 FPS. And because of this CPU limit, you don't actually always need as much GPU as you might think. For example, the RX 6700 XT is pretty much perfect for 1080p, although the 7000 series of AMD cards do perform better in some parts of the game, so I'd probably go for those if I was buying a new GPU. On the Nvidia side, value is tricky, but something like the 4060 or maybe the Ti should perform around the same. At 1440p, a 3080 barely ever gets maxed out, so anything around that mark in other games would be a good bet for that resolution. Cards like the 4070 and the 7800 XT should be great and maybe a little overkill at 1440p, but GPUs like the 3070 and 6800 XT should also be decent. And at 4K, well, really, there's only three, maybe four GPUs on the market that you can really recommend. I've tested the 7900 XTX and the 4080 and they perform pretty close to each other. In the cities, they can hit around 60 FPS at 4K. And when you combine that with a really quick CPU, they do both provide a pretty great experience at 4K. Now the 4090 is obviously a 4K beast, much faster than those two cards, but because you're often CPU limited in Star Citizen, you might actually only see better performance with the 4090 in areas like space or quantum travel but it does at least give you a lot of headroom at 4K for the future. We have to talk about VRAM when it comes to GPUs because one of the reasons that this video is so late in 2023, ideally I would have released this much earlier in the year, I've been on a sort of VRAM investigation with AMD cards. For Nvidia, things are pretty straightforward. 
VRAM isn't really a concern. If, say, a 6 gigabyte card like the 2060 runs out of VRAM at 1080p, it will be able to manage that situation pretty well. But AMD cards, even with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, suffer from these big frame drops as they run out of memory. I've tested multiple AMD cards and seen the same thing, and only once I went up to the 6700 XT, which has got 12 gigabytes of VRAM, did this problem disappear. But the good news is that all the high-end cards from AMD come with plenty of VRAM anyway, so it's not really too much of a concern when building a system aiming for high-end performance. Star Citizen itself isn't really that demanding of VRAM at this point. At 1080p and 1440p, it doesn't use too much. But I have seen my 3080 max out its 10 gigabytes of VRAM at 4K, although it's not really a 4K card anyway. The big friendly elephant in the room with graphics cards is upscaling. Nvidia and AMD do both provide basic upscaling support in their software, but CRG is also working on support for FSR2, DLSS2 and their own version of upscaling. Now this isn't in the game at the time that I'm recording this, but it will reduce the requirements for GPUs in the future. Upscaling tech won't help when the game is CPU bound, but it should allow for something like the 3080 to upscale to 4K fairly comfortably. If you're not completely sure how upscaling works, the easiest way to put it is that effectively something like the 3080 would run at 1440p with the performance of a 1440p resolution, but then it's upscaled to 4K, so the image looks better. Now, it doesn't look as good as 4K native, but it's pretty close in some cases, so it is a really good technology. And finally, before we move on, we must talk about CRG's plans for ray tracing. They're updating their lighting system with ray traced global illumination. Now, fortunately, they're also doing a version that won't need ray tracing, but for those of you who want the fancy lighting, it will be an option. Now, it's hard at this stage to know how the different cars from Nvidia and AMD will cope with this. Traditionally, Nvidia has been stronger at ray tracing, but I will be testing this when it's actually in our hands. Moving on to RAM, how much RAM do you need? If we're aiming for decent star system performance, we want 32 gigabytes. The game will run on 16, maybe with some tweaking of the page file, but 32 gigabytes will make a big difference to smoothness as you reduce the number of times the game has to swap things in and out of memory. If you're some sort of power user and you've got 100 Chrome tabs open, maybe there's a case for 64 gigabytes of RAM, but really it won't make any difference to your actual frames in Star Citizen. What will bring you more frames is the speed of the RAM. I've tested this on multiple systems with DDR4 and DDR5, and running quick RAM is one of the best ways to boost your performance. Now, make sure that your XMP or Expo profile is actually enabled in the BIOS. It's quite easy for this to get turned off if you reset the BIOS or anything like that. And if you really want to push things further, manually tuning the RAM will bring even more performance, but that's not a quick job and you'll need to do your research. Now, obviously, when aiming for a fairly high-end PC build, you're not going to be using a hard drive, a mechanical hard drive, but this is my just reminder that I always like to do that you cannot play Star Citizen on a hard drive. You have to use an SSD at least. But you might be thinking, well, I'm buying a, a decent PC. Should I go out there and get a blazing fast NVMe drive? Well, no. In all of the testing I've done, there's no performance difference between a bog standard, decent SSD versus faster NVMe drives. I've even tried two Gen 4 NVMe drives in RAID, and all you do really is save yourselves maybe a couple of seconds in loading times, but you won't gain any frames. There are other good reasons why you might want a fast drive, but Star Citizen isn't one of them. All of the amazing hardware that I've mentioned so far is pretty useless unless you have a good monitor. Over the last year, I got myself a new screen and the difference in color quality especially was massive. Now the first question to consider here is resolution. I know a lot of people swear by ultra wide screens and I really would recommend checking them out, they, they're great, but I'm gonna to stick to the standard resolutions here. I personally think that if you're spending all this money to get good performance in Star Citizen, you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice if you choose to play at 1080p. 1440p looks significantly better and Star Citizen really shines as you increase the resolution. If you're wanting the best though, 4K looks stunning. I have two 27 inch monitors side by side, one is 4K and the other is 1440p. And 4K, even at this size of monitor, looks noticeably better. The cost of 4K monitors is coming down, but they're not cheap. And obviously you'll need to spend more on the GPU if you want to run at 4K. 
So if you're on the budget, I'd really try and target 1440p if you can. When you're choosing your monitor, I cannot recommend Adaptive Sync highly enough. NVIDIA's G-Sync or AMD's FreeSync sync up your monitor's refresh rate to the game within certain frame ranges. This removes screen tearing and it's something that once you've tried, you just won't be able to go back. There are compatibility things that you need to be aware of between the two companies and each other's GPUs, but that's probably a bit too much to go into here. HDR is also worth thinking about. CRG have added experimental HDR support to the game, and for a while I've been using Windows 11's Auto HDR feature. HDR in most games just allows the colors to pop a lot more. CRG seem to be taking a slightly different approach, but, but like I say, it's still an experimental feature. When done well, I love HDR. My monitor can get pretty bright to the point that it almost feels like you're looking at the sun. But there are plenty of screens out there that can go much brighter than mine and also get much darker. It's really worth considering OLEDs as well. They have the ability for each pixel to be individually dimmed or brightened. And when looking around at something like space in SC, they can look absolutely stunning. There are maybe some burning concerns to think about there, but I've not heard from anybody personally having that issue. My recommendation on monitors would be to check out the YouTube channel Monitors Unboxer. It's a spin-off of Hardware Unbox and they provide very detailed reviews of monitors. Now we get to the fun stuff, the things that take the Star Citizen experience to the next level. Let's start with joysticks. I love joysticks. If you're looking to take your flight experience up a notch, joysticks are the best option. I've tested the Thrustmaster T16000s and the VKB Gladiator NXTs and my opinion is that you should just skip the Thrustmasters and go straight for the VKBs. They're a significant step up in quality and also just the amount of buttons. VKB sell a standard and premium version. The premium version, again, has got more control, binding options. Whatever you choose, joysticks are just much more fun to fly with. It can take a little time to adjust from keyboard and mouse, but if you want to feel like you're actually flying a spaceship, this is the way to go. And in order to take joysticks to the next level, you really should mount them. I do have a 5% off discount code with Predator Mount in the description, but even if I didn't, I would definitely be singing the praises of these things. Compared to just having your sticks sitting on the table, these mounts feel a hundred times better. Everything feels more solid, you can really throw some weight into your movements, and it just, again, feels like you're actually flying a spaceship. These mounts are adjustable, they're really well made, and highly, highly recommended. Next up, the Toby Eye Tracker. I tested this thing out when CRG first announced the partnership, and it's great. In terms of that great word, immersion, this device does wonders. It tracks your eyes and head movement and allows for some pretty wild control in game. For ship combat, in my opinion, it does actually improve your abilities. Being able to look around the cockpit in battle is genuinely helpful and it's another highly recommended product. FOIP can be quite fun to mess around with. Face over IP works by using a camera to track your facial movements and then translates that into the game. You can do this with your phone, but it works better with a better camera and I'm not actually sure how useful this is for playing Starcism, but it can be pretty fun. Another option for more control and the ability to feel you more like you're in a spaceship would be Game Glass. You can use your phone or tablet to give yourself more controls. You've got different shards that can control different aspects of Star Citizen. Very cool. But after going through all this, we, we do have to ask the question, is now the right time to build a PC for Star Citizen? I think it's always really important to ask this question because the game has been in development for such a long time that lots of people have built a PC and then built another PC and built another PC. And the problem with PC hardware is that as soon as you buy something, it's pretty much out of date instantly. Now, actually, it's quite an interesting time because I don't think there's any major releases of CPUs or GPUs coming up in the next few months, maybe even half a year. So it could be quite a good time to buy. Prices are pretty reasonable as well at this stage. The big factor that we need to now acknowledge is that Squadron 42 might actually come out in the next couple of years. So people will actually want a PC that can play that game. My thinking is that a high-end PC built today should be able to play Squadron in two years without any issues. We'll see whether that's a good prediction, but I'm pretty hopeful. Yes, it will be more demanding. There'll be technology like ray tracing in that game. But as we mentioned, we will also have things like upscaling and hopefully a lot of optimization. Alongside that, Star Season itself is becoming gradually more and more playable. Each patch brings more reasons to actually play the game. Throughout 2024, we should see a number of significant improvements, things like the star map or all the first person improvements we saw at CitizenCon. But also, tech like Vulcan should finally make it in and hopefully help with performance. So if you do build a high-end PC now, you at least get to put it to work in the persistent universe with all its bugs. 
Ultimately, if you were to build a PC now, there's still a good chance that you'll have to replace it before we get some sort of official release of the Persistent Universe. But if you want to play what we have right now and in the not too distant future, Squadron 42, I'd say now's a pretty good point to buy a PC for Star Citizen.